He's uh, a very experienced uh, brachytherapy radiation oncologist. He's also the president of Radiating Hope. And if you read many papers on, from a radiation oncologist's point of view on brachytherapy, you'll see Dr. Frank's name in a lot of them. So we're really lucky to have him present today. And I'll just say one more thing. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to message me or Betty throughout the presentation, and we'll be happy to make sure that Dr. Eink answers those questions during some scheduled breaks. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Eink. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. I, what I hope is uh, sort of give you not only the way that we're, we're uh, teaching in this course about HDR brachytherapy, but also give you some practical tips doing brachytherapy cases. And uh, really what I wanted to, please, if anyone has any questions, interrupt. You're more than uh, welcome to ask. I want to talk, we'll talk a little bit about presentation, about workup and treatment, but most importantly about the importance of brachytherapy classifications, uh, some comparisons of point A to image-guided brachytherapy. And uh, when I use the term IGBT or image-guided brachytherapy, just think Jack Astro approach. I want to present to you a normal tissue dose constraints, which you've already seen some of, and, and then results of, of using image-guided brachytherapy. Presentation can be quite different depending on the patient, depending on the country, and even within the United States, depending on the part of the United States, many patients with that normal PAP. But certainly, we still have many patients with coital bleeding, vaginal bleeding, pelvic pain, renal failure, hydronephrosis, and other symptoms related, unfortunately, to metastatic disease. Histologies in, in the, the United States are about 70% squamous cell carcinoma, 20% I don't think that varies a lot worldwide, although uh, you all may see somewhat more squamous cell carcinoma and we see somewhat more adenocarcinoma here. There are also unusual histologies and just to suffice it to say that's not what I'm talking about in this talk. Small cell carcinoma rab did differently. Uh, patterns of spread important to understand. Uh, in cervical cancer, you know, although the growth starts in the cervix, uh, it can spread. It, it can. I'm not sure if it's my internet connection. There seems to be a little bit of uh, a noise. Although cancer certainly starts in the cervix and, and usually at the squamocolumnar junction of the endocervix, it spreads down along the vaginal wall, it purely into the fundus of the uterus, and very importantly, it can spread laterally into the parametria. We still, although staging has changed to incorporate lymph node status very recently, as their FIGO stage, indicating the status of disease. The, the here's just a chart that it's handy to use showing the risk of pelvic lymph node metastases with varying local stages, and, and from there, the risk of periodic uh, okay. metastases in some ways, which external beam vagina the groin. So, you would want to include the groin lymph nodes in your external beam fields as well. So cervix cancer drains to parametria, which I mentioned, to obturator lymph nodes, which sit along walls, internal iliac, external iliac, and eventually to periodic nodes. As I said, the lower half of the vagina drains to inguinal nodes, so always important not to forget that special drainage pattern. FIGO state year, and I think most of you have looked at this, once we start to get, we define locally advanced as between a 1B2, which is clinical lesions over four centimeters in size, and really any stage 2B and beyond where there's parametrial involvement. 
definition that allows us to determine patients could have curative surgery and which patients should have definitive radiation or chemo rads. Workup, it depends on the resources that you have. It's very common here to get CT for staging. It's more sensitive and specific than conventional CT, but it requires F11, FDG, and a special kind of scanner, and there are many parts of the world that this is just not possible. More commonly, I think, is a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to look for signs of any enlarged lymph nodes or metastatic disease. In terms of treatment, uh, like I mentioned, FIGO staging really helps us to which patients can go straight to surgery and have a reasonable chance of being cured uh, with surgery. And those are 1A and 1B1 patients. Women with stage 1B2 to 4A patients should have radiotherapy, and very importantly, that should be followed by Looking at stage at presentation, in the United States, most patients nowadays, because of screening and pap smear, et cetera, show up with uh, localized disease about 70%, 30% present with stage three and four. This is full of a uh, lower middle income country at Institute Curie in Senegal. Only about 40, 45% of patients present with stage one to two disease and uh, over 50% present with locally advanced or metastatic disease. It's a really important group of patients that you're not going to cure without radiation. So the treatment paradigm, as I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here in lower middle income countries, is that for, for early stage disease, patients either go directly to surgery if they have stage one non-bulky, or if they have disease, have some form of neoadjuvant therapy prior to surgery. And really it's the 3B patients, which are over half of the patients that uh, require some form of radiation to have the best chance at cure. And without brachytherapy, you are probably just not going to cure stage 3B patients unless they have a really excellent complete clinical response with uh, uh, initial This is a uh, journal beam that I'm talking about that I think is still very commonly delivered in the United States and uh, probably throughout the world. It's a four-field whole pelvis approach with blocks or multi-leaf collimators that look this shape. Very important to include sacral node at least down to the bottom of S3 and bring the fields anterior enough so that you encompass both your external iliac and internal iliac lymph nodes. Certainly if the lower vagina is involved, uh, one would have to change the field to encompass groin nodes in this location here. Generally, patients receive 3960 centigrade to 4,500 centigrade, and we generally treat all four fields. IMRT is another way. I'm not going to go into IMRT contouring guidelines. I think that's a completely different talk. And if you have been treating cervical cancer for a while, you have and you have 3D planning and IMRT capabilities, it's certainly worth it. Uh, but I will say that even in the United States, many academic radiation oncologists still don't believe that IMRT actually covers the target that we wanted to cover and are still using for field uh, radiation. Um, and then uh, external beam is really important to follow with brachytherapy. And one of the principles of external beam is it reduces the size of the primary tumor, really producing more favorable geometry for the brachytherapy implant. There are many patients that at the outset of advanced disease, we can't tell what cervix and what's, what's tumor, we keep loss, and it would be very difficult to do a brachytherapy implant on those patients unless you did purely interstitial brachytherapy. And we also think of external beam as eradicating subclinical de disease in the lymph nodes in the parametria uh, and elsewhere. Brachytherapy then comes in and delivers radiation to the primary tumor, really for ablative treatment of the tumor itself. 
So this is an example of the incredible responses you can get with external beam radiation therapy with concurrent chemotherapy. This is 4,500 centigrade showing a greatly expanded cervix. In this patient, pick out an os here on speculum examination, but clearly this patient's had a complete response. The tumor is much smaller and brachytherapy can come in without the use of needles with just intracavitary brachytherapy to ultimately cure this patient. Not a patient who would do well with surgery alone. So talking a little bit about the history of brachytherapy, brachytherapy really started with tandems, which are these long curved instruments here, and ovoids, described by Hinchke in soon after Fletcher suit Delclos, really what we consider modern uh, radiation applicators. At that time, reactors produced cesium-137, and eventually iridium-192 became available. But cesium-137 for about 40 years was the mainstay of brachytherapy treatment for cervical cancer. Combined with extra radiation therapy, Sorry, I, I can't see the rest of my slide for the, the videos of all of you here. Combined with external beam, the application of therapy in the cure of cervix cancer. Just one example of this is there were several patterns of care studies. This one by uh, Montana and Hanks uh, showed that there were three factors associated with improved survival, and adding intracavitary brachytherapy was one of the strongest ones. He also, on that time, we were doing low dose rate brachytherapy with uh, uh, one, two, or three applications. And he really found that two or more brachytherapy applications instead of one led to improved survival. Probably that's because the first application produces better tumor. You come in with your second application and that be in your extremely high dose area. And they really said that a combined paracentral dose, that means 0.8 dose of 65 gray or more, was beneficial. We'll expound on that in a couple minutes here, where 65 gray is not an adequate dose by modern standards. So this study was done on patients in the United States. It's a SEER analysis showing the utilization of brachytherapy. And it's very interesting that despite all of this data in the 90s showing that brachytherapy led to improved survival in patients, brachytherapy has really declined. You took a major plummet in 2003, United States in 2003, is uh, centers started adopting IMRT and deciding, you know, why should we do all of these brachytherapy procedures, which are technically difficult and and take more time when we could just treat these patients with IMRT boost. So in 2003, until brachytherapy testing, the utilization of brachytherapy was down to 40%, which is really interesting because in this same report, they showed that brachytherapy led to an improvement in disease-specific survival and overall survival in all the patients that had it compared to patients with no brachytherapy. So I'm to the choir here about the importance of brachytherapy, but uh, I think you're, you're probably all on board with that. So the original Fletcher suit Dalclos applicator included a long tube going up into the uterine fundus, as well as two uh, ovoid or and self producing what you can see the dotted line here is the classic pear-shaped isodose curve which we still like to see today. Um, in the past, when using cesium-137, uh, cesium-137 physicians always speak about it as its activity being in milligrams of equivalent. And we had sources of different sizes, two centimeter sources. Some of you are probably familiar with LDR sources. And really there were three lined up in the tandem and one source on each side of the cervix. And pay attention to the, the numbers here because this was our classic loading. It would change this periodically for uh, differences in anatomy for patients. But really, we put a 15 source at the tip of the tandem, 
two 10 sources uh, in the lower tandem, and then a 15 in each ovoid, but we varied the size of this depending on how big the ovoid caps were. If the caps were large, we could, we could accommodate a larger source because we weren't limited by vaginal mucosal dose, whereas if the caps were really small, we would get a much higher vaginal mucosal dose and we would tend to favor putting 10s or 12s inside of the ovoids. So this will come into play when I talk about loading schemes for HDR in a few minutes. Just a comparison of low dose rate versus high dose rate. You've probably seen these comparisons. Cesium-137 we loved because it had a 30-year half-life and you could have it in the clinic for your almost your entire For half-life, most HDR machines produced today are Iridium-192. Electa has a cobalt source, which is much a longer life, which uh, specifically is being used more often in lower middle income countries because of the difficulty with carrying these Iridium sources internationally, flying them in every three months using the source. But both are felt and uh, cobalt sources. Um, dose rate for low dose rate, uh, typically two gray per hour or less. High dose rate is 12 gray per hour or higher. Patients in the low dose rate era were confined to bed in shielded rooms for one to two days, whereas HDR is an outpatient. And low dose rate has exposure to staff and personnel. Even the people come, that come and deliver the meals every day, we worried about their amount of exposure. High dose rate, of course, is done in a, in a room that's shielded, and there's less or, in some cases, no staff exposure to radiation. Just to talk a little bit about the types of applicators that we use, this is a standard tandem and ovoid applicator. So again, tandem long tube that goes up into the uterus. The flange is set, so it's at the cervical os. So when you sound the uterus, you'll, you'll determine how many centimeters and set your flange at that location. The ovoids are meant to sit on either side, almost touching this flange. So they really need to be up um, pushing on the cervix itself. A lot of times when we'll can never get the ovoids completely up to the level of this flange, and you're not going to be obtaining that classic pear-shaped isodose curve, or if you are, you're going to be overdosing the vaginal mucosa while trying to get enough dose to your to, to the cervix. Tandem and rings are a little bit different. These are an older version of tandem and ring that are made of plastic, so they're CT MRI compatible. So I think it's 24, 20 centimeters, and I think there's one other size. But really, you can choose the size that uh, the patient's anatomy will accommodate. These larger ones require the cervix to be dilated. There are new titanium ones that are CT MRI compatible that do not require dilator much more. And this is a rectal retractor. So the nice thing about these tandem and rings is this rectal retractor provides a mechanical pushing behind the ring to literally push the rectum farther away from, from your isodose curves. And this is a tandem and cylinder applicator. So there are some patients that I'll get in a few minutes where we just can't get ovoids in. We can't get a ring in because they have such constricted anatomy. And uh, this is perfect for those patients. That, uh, you can set the tandem again so that the flange here is right up against the uh, cervical os. And that makes sure that when you put it in all the way up. A disadvantage of this is it doesn't spread dose as far laterally as the ring or as the tandem and ovoid. So you have to keep that in mind. Probably not going to work for a really large tumor that's much over three and a half to four centimeters. So in terms of anatomy, again, this is a picture of the sources in place. This, and now we're going to get into the prescription of dose. The prescription of dose really depends on whether or not you're using image guidance a la Jack Estro, 
with CT or MR imaging with each implant, or whether you're going to prescribe to point A. So it really has to do with what your resources are and whether you have it uh, in the department for three-dimensional dosimetry. If you don't have the ability to CT patients with the applicator in place, you certainly can do uh, point A dosimetry with two-dimensional orthogonal radiographs. Uh, using those, you determine point A and point B, your ICRU rectal and bladder points. Pres prescription dose and normal tissue constraints depend on whether you're prescribing a point A or to the high-risk CTP. So you need to be clear about this. I'm going to show you the prescription doses that we use and, and normal tissue constraints with point A dosimetry, but they are different from if you're using prescribing to the high using CT planning. So just a comparison of the two types of dosimetry, non-image guidance meaning you're, means you're prescribing to point A, whereas with image-guided brachytherapy, if you're doing a CT, you're prescribing to the high-risk CTV. You're, and this high-risk CTV by Jack Astro definition, higher cervix with any extensions of tumor. Sometimes on CT, that's difficult to see. Uh, Jack Astro has done a lot of work on the incorporation of at least one MRI during the treatment planning process. But of course, here, here's another point where you have to decide what resources are available to you. And the dose that we carry uh, in the patient's uh, chart and on the spreadsheet, if we're prescribing to the high-risk CTV, is actually the dose to 90% of the high-risk CTV, which in most cases is going to be higher than your prescription dose. Um, it, the non-image guided brachytherapy includes uh, only orthogonal radiographs, although there are many people prescribing to point A with CT dosimetry. Image guided brachytherapy requires volumetric imaging like a CT. In non-image guided brachytherapy or point A dosimetry, the ICRU points on a determine rectal and bladder doses. And there's not a sigmoid point. If you have a rectal contrast or rectal marker in place, sometimes you can choose another point along the rectum. If your marker is high enough, if you can see that the rectum is getting close to the tandem higher up, you should put a second point there and look at rectal dose. That's probably a surrogate for sigmoid dose. With image-guided brachytherapy, we actually contour the rectum, bladder, and sigmoid, and we use those contours to determine the hottest two cc's, or that's the two cc of that structure getting the highest dose. With non-image-guided brachytherapy, we can use surrogates for proximal vaginal surface and the posterior extent of the tan uh, of the ovoids or any packing that you have in place. With image-guided brachytherapy, we can calculate directly the maximum vaginal surface dose. But even in that case, oftentimes we'll use the ICRU rectal dose uh, because it's also a nice surrogate for vaginal toxicity. Just a, a quick view of uh, where point A lies. It's two centimeters up from the cervical os, which could be a flange, which is right here, uh, and two centimeters over cervical os. And uh, classic definitions for rectum are 0.5 centimeters behind the tandem and the uh, posterior point of the uh, bladder balloon as it's closest to the ovoid. So of the bladder balloon that's part of the Foley catheter. The ICRU points, if we look at those compared to a high-risk CTV or, or to 3D dosimetry, really there's no ICRU point for sigmoid because you can't see it on 2D radiographs. And the bladder point oftentimes does not correspond and, and has not a strong relation to which
highest dose are. And you can directly move your isodose curves to minimize uh, that dose. So in terms of dose guidelines, if you're prescribing and you're giving approximately 39.5 gray external beam, the 0.8 dose carry is an EQD2 points on the speed. That's the equivalent dose at two gray fractions. Uh, with stage 1A, She has other things she needs to do, so that's why I must not say. Let me talk to her and ask what she has now. Um, Dr. Ike? I think there must be some problem with Dr. Ang's connection. Um, hey, Adam. Yeah, sorry, I lost my connection too. Let me quickly see if I can call Dr. Ang. Yeah. Uh, give me a second, I'll, I'll log back in. Perfect. Okay, thanks, yeah. Hey guys. Hi. Sorry about that. I completely lost my internet connection. So we're back. Can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's continue. Sorry about that. So really, you know, Jet Gastro guidelines are to give greater than 90 gray to your high-risk CTV. But if you're prescribing to point A, the most you can give with any of the uh, American Brachytherapy Society fractionation schemes or with eight gray times three is 80 to 84 gray. So you need to keep that in mind. You can't push to 90 to 95 gray with point A symmetry. And these are just some guidelines for pelvic sidewall dose based on whether the parametria are involved or uninvolved. These are the American Brachytherapy 
Society guidelines for fractionation. You don't see eight grade times three on here, but we're using a lot more eight grade times three in patients with favorable anatomy, and that's a perfectly fine way of, of fractionating patients if you're li you have limited time and availability on your HDR machine. Really, the, the, uh, this is where I got the 80 to 84 grade. This is the highest you're going to get for EQD2s to point A. Your limitations for your ICRU bladder point are here. Your limitation should be about 85 gray if you're giving 8 gray times 3. And this is the limitation for rectal dose, 72.5 uh, gray. Compare that to Jack Astro guidelines that are, you can see these are only applied for image guided brachytherapy when you're doing 3D dosimetry. They say that your high risk CTV, as defined by your D90 to your CTV, should be greater than 90 to 95 gray, but acceptable is greater than 85 gray. So in parentheses, these are acceptable, but the first numbers are desirable. So you really have to keep your organs at risk under consideration when you're uh, deciding whether you can go all the way to 90 to 95 gray. The only way that you're gonna get patients to 90 to 95 gray is by running your D90s really hot, greater than 110% of prescription dose. If, if you only get to 102, 103% with your D90, which we used to do all the time before these guidelines came out, you're gonna get less than 85 gray. So you really need to run your D90s a little hotter if you're prescribing to high-risk CTV and doing 3D planning. Now the, the organs at risk constraints are rectum, bladder, and sigmoid. And with image-guided brachytherapy, we use the maximum uh, 2 cc point, uh, the maximum 2 cc volume. So the, the dose to the, the hottest 2 cc's with rectum, that should be less than 65 gray is desirable, but up to 75 is, is acceptable. Bladder, less than 80 gray, but up to 90 gray is acceptable. And sigmoid, less than 70 gray, but up to 75 is acceptable. In terms of applicator placement, um, we recommend that brachytherapy be started as such time to finish the entire treatment course within eight weeks. That's an American Brachytherapy Society guideline, and Embrace has really confirmed that for every one week longer than eight weeks, you need to give an additional five gray to maintain the same local control. And you should also start on when on pelvic exam, the tumor, if on pelvic exam, the tumor remains larger than four to five centimeters, you have several options. You could give additional external beam. So if we go to 45 gray for most patients, you could give an additional three fractions and go to 50 gray. You could wait one to two weeks for shrinkage. That's not ideal because we're up against this eight week rule. Or you can plan an interstitial implant, which is, is uh, more complex and should only be done, I think in, in most experienced centers. This is a Vienna ring that's put out by Nucleotron or Electa. The ring actually has a series of holes in it that you can place needles through. And you can see how nicely you can expand your isodose curves if you've got parametrial extension on one side that's over two centimeters from the tandem. The only way you're really gonna dose that well is with needles. Now needles will really increase your D90. So they really help with that that to greater than 90 gray EQD2 at the end, but you also have to be careful how much you're loading into the needles. And we usually recommend only 10 to 15% of your monitor units are, are uh, of your uh, dwell, dwell seconds are within the needles. So brachytherapy in patients with small tumors can be integrated into the external beam radiation therapy. We do that occasionally. We may give the patient four external beam fractions, and then on the fifth day, give them a fraction of brachytherapy. But normally, we start at the end of the external beam as soon as possible after the last treatment. We treat two fractions per week. We don't allow chemotherapy on brachytherapy days, but normally patients are, have completed chemotherapy by the time they start their brachytherapy. The placement is done uh, in our hands using moderate sedation with Versed and fentanyl. 
the recommendation in, in the United States are that patients have a heart rate and blood pressure monitors, that they're on an EKG monitor, and we monitor their oxygen saturation throughout that procedure. Alternatively, you can do a paracervical block or a pudendal block with oral sedatives, and in some patients that works fine, but many patients need the anxiolytic qualities of Versed in order to get through the procedure. The other advantage of Versed is it causes amnesia, so when patients come back for their second fraction, they don't have this traumatic memory from the first fraction. They don't remember any of the prior uh, placement. Uh, a catheter is placed before we place the devices. We always use seven cc's of dilute contrast in the Foley balloon. We do bimanual exam to determine the orientation of the uterus, whether it's antiverted, retroverted. Many times it, with image-guided brachytherapy, we already have imaging that tells us if it's antiverted or retroverted. If the uterus is really antiverted, I add 150 cc's of sterile water or saline to the bladder, and that's enough to get it uh, pushed out so that uh, the, the degree of antiversion is less. Uh, determine vaginal size with digital exam. That'll give you some idea of whether you can use, or what size ovoids you can use, or what size ring you can use. The cervix is visualized with a speculum. If it's unclear whether you're actually seeing the os or seeing some abnormality within the tumor, you can actually feel the os much better than you can see it in many cases. So you may want to do a digital exam and feel for the depression of the, of the uterine os, of the cervical os. We do betadine swab uh, times three to the cervical os just to limit bacteria to some extent. And then we sound the uterus and determine the length to the tip of the fundus. You may need to serially dilate if you're using older tandem and ring applicators. That tandem is pretty large, and so you may need to use these Hager dilators to serially dilate the cervix and choose the appropriate applicator to match the patient's anatomy. And I'll give you a, a few uh, keys that I use. Tandem and ovoids. This is a Bavarian tandem and ovoid kit. They come with a series of caps. <clears throat> it's going to be an unusual patient, at least here in the United States, that can accommodate large ovoids. But if a patient is, is multiparous and has had uh, babies recently, they sometimes can accommodate large ovoids. A uh, nulliparous woman who's never had children, uh, many times we're stuck with small ovoids or even tandem and, and cylinder. I never use, these are called mini ovoids, see they're flat on one side. I never use them. There's very little shielding around where the source is going to be. They lead to very high proximal vaginal doses. And as you all know, you need to limit your proximal vagina to about 140 gray EQD2. So with this, I have a rule that the 150% isodose curve can go almost to the surface but not come out of the ovoids. With these, the 150% and 200% isodose curves are almost always going to come out beyond the surface to the vaginal mucosa, and that's why I don't like them. Choose a tandem that matches the flexion of the uterus. Advantages of tandem and ovoid. Yes. Can I stop you for just a minute? Yeah. We'll just take a quick um, little question and answer break, see if anyone sure. has any questions at the moment. Please. Again, feel free, so you are muted, but feel free to message me or Betty if you have any questions at the moment. Betty is the Rios Contra Cancer Admin. So while you guys are posing your questions, if you have any, I guess I can make a, a few points as well. So I think a few slides back, uh, Dr. Frank mentioned about the timeline. So this was the eight, eight weeks uh, for the full treatment. Mm -hmm. and and if you remember from, just reiterate from Claire's presentation, which I think was last week on radiobiology, we talked about extensively the radiobiology to the tumor and to healthy tissues. So we talked about a five gray additional needed for each week of prolongation. And again, remember that's very important because your organs at risk, you're just adding five gray to the, org to the organs at risk. Um, whereas the tumor by adding five gray it's just maintaining that same tumor control. So again, the longer your, your treatment is, um, the worse it's going to be for your organs at risk while keeping the tumor control the same. 
So that time is, is quite important. The last point about the, about the mini ovoids, again, Dr. Wright just mentioned how uh, you get, he would get more vaginal stenosis if the, the 150 um, isodose line is going out. Again, maintaining that 140 gray total equivalent dose in two gray. So again, remember as well as, as some of you all will be using rings, which are quite different than the historical um, data that is out there for traditional loading schemes, say using cesium sources. So again, pay attention to how much you're loading the rings and, and where the isodose line is. And, and you can use your, your EQD2 sheet that we provide for you, and you can actually look and see you know, what your, your vaginal doses are. And you can see for yourself whether you think you're loading too much or too little. So a couple of things to pay attention to. I don't see any questions at the moment. So Dr. Wright, you can continue. All right. We'll answer more questions at the end. So again, tandem and ovoids, the nice thing about ovoids is they can spread dose laterally. So the last thing I do after placement is I actually spread the ovoid so they're as far lateral as possible. And that can actually improve your dose, your lateral doses. And then they give us the classic pear-shaped isodose curve. <clears throat> Disadvantages, patients with vaginal disease, vaginal extension of tumor, oftentimes cannot accommodate even small ovoids. And for them, we have to switch to tandem and cylinder or a small ring. But I will say that it's rare that a patient doesn't tolerate small ovoids and can tolerate getting a ring in either. So both of those have limitations of needing a certain size introitus and needing a certain diameter to the proximal vagina. I mentioned mini ovoids and the vaginal surface dose problems with them. With tandem and ovoid, there is a rectal retractor with tandem and ovoid. The variant one has been recalled. So with most tandem and ovoid systems, you have to use gauze packing, which can be technically cumbersome or difficult to get it where you want it. And tandem and ovoid system is also a flexible uh, system. The tandem is never going to be in the same position relative to the ovoids each day, at least with the variant tandem and ovoid applicator. So you are always going to need to plan each fraction. In terms of loading times, again, I mentioned the tip of the tandem getting 15, 10, 10 in the lower tandem, and then 15s if you use medium or large ovoids. We reduce for small ovoids this, the ovoid uh, loading to a 10. And then you can see the dwell positions with HDR are a little bit different than two centimeter cesium sources. We divide the number of dwell positions in the tandem by three and give one third of the seconds to each position. So all of the dwell positions in the tip, the top third will get 15, middle third will get 10, and lower third will get 10 and then the dwell positions within the ovoid will get 10. We'll get 15, I'm sorry. The typical six centimeter tandem length has 13 dwell positions if you're using 0.5 centimeter steps, but you need to, to be cognizant of your step size because you can do step sizes as small as 2.5 millimeters. Um, looking at loading times, the six centimeter tandem, like I mentioned, gets 15 at the tip, and 10, 10 inferior to that. Four centimeter tandem, 15 at the tip. You divide that in half and give 15 in the upper half and 10 in the lower half. And a two centimeter tandem just gets 15 in the, in the dwell positions. Two centimeter tandem is gonna be pretty unusual. Most patients, I would say six centimeters, probably most common. If you have an eight centimeter tandem, you're again still gonna divide the dwell positions into thirds and give the upper third 15 and the lower, the middle third and the lower third 10. In terms of ovoid cap sizes, with a large cap, we use 20 seconds on some patients, but you have to keep an eye on vaginal surface mucosa. With medium caps, I think it's safest with large and medium to use 15. And with small caps, you probably are gonna to wanna to use 10. All these times in seconds are then scaled up and normed to the position of point A. Never load a dwell position protruding from the cervix. So you can see here, I, I pulled up this, probably not the ideal, 
because I don't even like this dwell position that's actually within the flange here, I would have stopped the dwell positions right here as you get to the, the top of the flange. So uh, never load a dwell position protruding from the cervix. That leads to higher vaginal surface and point and ICRU rectal doses. The 200% isodose curve should be well within the ovoid and limit 150% isodose curve to the surface or below. Tanman ring has advantages that it's fixed geometry. So you could, if the patient, you believe the patient's anatomy is consistent, use a library of plans and not have to individually plan each fraction because when you put the same size ring with the same size tandem, that geometry should be consistent from, from uh, application to application. You still should do orthogonal radiographs and look at your bladder and rectal doses since rectum uh, it can be somewhat of a mobile structure or filled with gas or stool at any time. Rings come in different sizes. That's an advantage. Choose the size that fits the patient's anatomy. And tandem and rings do have a rectal retractor that assures tolerable rectal dose. Disadvantage, for me, I use tandem and ovoid because I have a hard, of, hard time getting the ring through the introitus on many patients. So a, a large ring can be difficult to use. Smaller rings should work. And disadvantages, it's also not going to work in a patient with restriction of the upper vagina diameter or with uh, a lot of patients with vaginal tumor involvement. Loading times for tandem and ring. Tandem is the same as a tandem and ovoid. Dwell times in the ring depend on ring size, uh, and there are many sizes. I think Adam's given you guidelines for, for each size ring and, and how, to, how many dwell positions to use and how to load that. I will say here at UCSD, we use three five millimeter dwell positions on each side. Others use four. Uh, others use six or eight 2.5 millimeter dwell positions on each side. So I would say pick a standard, use that every time, and just don't vary uh, from patient to patient. Otherwise, you're more likely to make mistakes. At UCSD, like I said, we use three to four dwell positions depending on the MD and we give them each 15 seconds to start for a large ring. Tenement cylinder has advantages. It's also a fixed geometry applicator, so once you, you uh, have a plan that you like, you can consistently use it for the remaining applications on that patient. You can use a library of plans. It's best in situations with vaginal stenosis or upper vaginal involvement. But the disadvantage, it really doesn't get that paracentral dose very high, your 0.8 dose. Prescribing to 0.8 may overdose vaginal mucosa, so you have to look at that closely. Use the largest cylinder as possible that will fit in, with, uh, fit in the patient. And for bulky residual disease, tandem and ring is probably not going to be the best option. You'd need to, to use needles along with it to get better lateral dose. So loading times for tandem and, and uh, cylinder. Load the tandem according to what we've talked about with tandem previously. The cylinder loading depends on the diameter of the cylinder and the length of the cylinder that you want to treat. If there's no vaginal involvement, we treat the proximal two to three centimeters, similar to what you would treat with a ring or ovoid. Uh, for a cylinder diameter, these are the dwell times that I use I don't know if you've given them guidelines for dwell positions within the cylinder, Adam, but... We have, at least okay. as a starting point, okay. um, with, uh, per, with our own particular definition of the, the planning aim length. Okay. But um, again, that's a starting point. If they want to discuss in their clinic and deviate, it's okay. Okay. But I would say a general rule for larger cylinders, you can get away with 15 seconds for each dwell position. For small and smaller cylinders... Your, the vaginal surface is going to get really hot if you use more than 10 seconds. You really need to use your tandem more than your cylinder positions if you can only accommodate a small cylinder. So for placement, tandems place first. Insert to the curve in the tandem or until it stops. The ring is placed over tandem and the device is attached securely. And then always look, make sure your ovoids, your ring, or your cylinder, top of your cylinder, are flush with the cervix. And I think that's really important when you're evaluating your geometry. 
And for tandem and ring, then the rectal retractor is placed last and deployed as much as the patient will tolerate. We use in clinic, again, do these uh, placements according to your own resources. Some centers here actually have CT in the brachytherapy suite. We do not. We use occasional transrectal and transabdominal ultrasound guidance, but I will say the vast majority of cases I don't use uh, any image guidance during the procedure. I CT the patients afterwards to determine that the geometry is adequate. This is our images from a project that Adam and I and others did in Senegal, where we actually created overlays, isodose overlays that overlay on the tandem and cylinder applicators. And you can actually create uh, the tandem and ring applicators. You can actually create a library of plans, do orthogonal radiographs, scale up your overlays to the magnification of your radiographs, and determine if your ICRU rectal and bladder points are within tolerable doses. When you're doing image guidance, some places, like I said, will incorporate a single MRI into their treatment planning process, and I think that's great if you have it. Most patients, you can just incorporate CT imaging. This is a picture of the bladder that's been drawn. There's dilute, seven cc's of dilute contrast in the Foley balloon and the high-risk CTV is contoured here, along with sigmoid in blue and rectum in brown. Dr. Ayn, can yes. I, uh, I'd like to ask one question here, yes. uh, which I think would be helpful for everyone. So some of the centers have the possibility of using MRI either now or in the future with their brachytherapy, also CT. How would you approach optimization differently if you're doing CT-based planning or MRI-based planning? Would you be just as aggressive with CT or, or less aggressive? Yeah, it's a good question. So if a patient has had a great response to external beam, there's limited utility in doing an MRI. You're not going to see very much. So, so if someone's had a great response, we do not get MRIs. We just get CT planning. If a patient has not had a great response, they still have some parametrial disease or gross disease that, <clears throat> that you can see or feel, we incorporate a single MRI scan either immediately prior to brachytherapy or with the brachytherapy applicators in place. You can see here, I guess this line doesn't show up that well. We do the same thing with our... If we incorporate MRI, our planning process is very similar. We still use the dwell positions that we've talked about in the tandem and ring or tandem and ovoid. We scale those up to point A, and then we are able to, in most cases, the point A dose is going to be higher than your high-risk CTV. Then the point A dose, when you prescribe to high-risk CTV, is actually going to be lower. So we, we dose escalate our high-risk CTV, whether we do CT or MRI, but we, uh, and so we don't change our technique a lot. The nice thing about the MRI, though, is we can make sure that the high-risk CTV is covered nicely uh, in our volumes. With CT, because you can't really see tumor, you can see cervix, you end up prescribing to the entire cervix, and sometimes you actually have to uh, give more OAR dose when you're prescribing to the whole cervix than if you can pull it back a little bit because of your, sorry, I'm just plugging my computer in because I can see the battery is a little bit low. So we, you, you can actually pull back your isodose curves a little bit if your MRI shows a favorable response, but we still do treat the entire cervix in patients. I don't know if that made discussion made sense. Uh, yes, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So contouring with image guidance, again, here's another uh, image showing the tandem the, and ovoid isodose curves with the high-risk CTV, which is really the entire cervix. <clears throat> the bladder's contoured here. You see, if you had a point on this uh, balloon in the bladder, you're going to greatly underestimate bladder dose by using an ICRU bladder point. Rectal, rectum is down here, and it's really sigmoid that's closest to the high-risk CTV in this patient. 
This is just a copy of the spreadsheet. We have a, a similar spreadsheet that we use at UCSD where we carry point A right and left dose. We carry the D90 to the high-risk CTV. We carry the V100 to the high-risk CTV. And we carry the 2cc doses to sigmoid, bladder, rectum, and sometimes small bowel if it looks like there's small bowel in the vicinity. We enter the doses on the spreadsheet. Even after the very first application, we carry those doses out for the, the remaining fractions to see if we're delivering a tolerable dose if every fraction was exactly the same as the first one. What to do if one or more OAR doses exceed tolerance? Well, what generally we always start with is we repack if it's a tandem and ovoid and see if we can achieve better spacing between the ovoids and the rectum or ovoids and the bladder. If you're still exceeding tolerance, you can actually vary the position of point A a little bit, but you don't want to vary it a lot because anytime you vary the position of point A, you're no longer using classic uh, dos point A dosimetry. What we have done is if our OARs are a little bit hot, we move point A to 18 millimeters lateral to the tandem instead of 20 millimeters. And in fact, if we have a really small tumor and we know we're prescribing a high-risk CTV, we may start with an 18 millimeter point A uh, position because we know that that's going to be covering tumor and then, uh, and then modify our isodose curves from there. If the OAR doses are exceptionally low, this is one opportunity to dose escalate with point A dosimetry. If your OAR doses are well within tolerance, you actually can prescribe to a point A that's 22 millimeters lateral to the tandem instead of 20 millimeters lateral to the tandem. But never move this point more than two millimeters. If you play around with it a little bit on your treatment planning system, you'll see why I say that it will dramatically change the appearance of your isodose curves. And in most patients, unless you're really struggling with your OAR doses, you probably don't want to do that. Just a slide in terms of outcomes. You know, we really believe that doing 3D planning with image guidance based on Jack Astro guidelines is really the best approach. What you have to know, though, is that Jack Astro uses needles in about 60% of their patients. They use the tandem and ring applicator with needle holes in it. And for most people out there that are, that are starting a brachytherapy program, you're probably not going to be doing interstitial, at least at the beginning. And you're probably not going to see the same kind of dosimetry that Jack Astro has, has published. But as long as you get a D90 to your high-risk CTV uh, and achieve an EQD2 of 87, your actuarial, local, regional control, and overall survival is 91, 91, and 75%. So really excellent results with these doses while also limiting your OARs to, to these reasonable doses as well. So the Jack Astro guidelines changed quite recently based on a paper that was published about 18 to 24 months ago where they upped their suggested high-risk CTV dose and actually reduced their bladder and sigmoid doses uh, significantly and incorporated an ICRU rectal point. Uh, that was based on their long-term local control and toxicity data. I will say that in clinic, we meet these these more constr uh, these more precise Jack Astro constraints about 60% of the time. There are 40% of patients that you are never going to meet Jack Astro guidelines. But as long as you're within the acceptable, you may not be within the optimal dose constraints. But as long as you're within the acceptable dose constraints, you'll still have reasonably low uh, toxicity. In conclusion, brachytherapy is essential to the cure of cervical cancer. I think everybody accepts that in, in 2019. HDR brachytherapy is more convenient, but really does have a lower therapeutic ratio than LDR brachytherapy. I wrote four or more fractions should be used. You can tell this is our conclusions from an older talk. We really have moved to many patients getting three fractions of eight gray now. Uh, choose an applicator type that's easiest for you, but also that works with the patient's particular anatomy. 
and using IGRT results in re- reduced toxicity, but of course may not be possible in 2019 at some resource limited centers. So I'll, I'll give folks a chance if anyone has any other questions and is still on Zoom. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Eink, uh, for a wonderful presentation. To say something, you know, you talked about these, these cure rates and, and I think you made a really good point about Jack Astro and Embrace 2 where 60% of the cases were using interstitial needles. So definitely keep that in mind as you all are planning without needles that you probably won't be able to achieve everything and, and don't be discouraged or push things in some weird way. Stick to conventions as Dr. Eink has suggested and you'll still get good cure rates, maybe not as good as with interstitial needles, but that's a very important point. Though I would like to say to Dr. Eink, who may not be aware, that at least one of our centers just started using interstitial needles a few weeks ago. Um, So I'd like to applaud everyone on this call for really um, doing the best effort at your respective clinics and and pushing the the envelope in, in physics. So I'd like to congratulate everyone for, for your hard work. Um, it means a lot to our patients. We have one question, Dr. Eink, if you could go back to the Jack, the Jack Astro guidelines for guidelines, you had a slice on that. If you could just um, sort of recap uh, that slide one more time. Um, yeah, that's one of the- it's a little bit complex. Numbers in parentheses are acceptable, but the first number is optimal. <clears throat> So they say you should get a high-risk CTV dose of greater than 90 to 95 gray EQD2 uh, when, using, when you're using D90 for the, the uh, dose to 90% of the organ as you're, you're calculating the dose. But acceptable is to get greater than 85. And like I say, in practice, in our clinic, 40% of patients, we stick with 85 or higher because we simply cannot get the high D90s that are required to get to 90 to 95 gray unless we start adding needles. <clears throat> but remember, Jack Astro says this is acceptable. They say shoot for this, but this is acceptable. Rectum 2cc dose <clears throat> should be less than 65. This is the number that went down recently based on their toxicity data but acceptable is up to 75. If you do that first implant and you carry your doses out, your 2cc rectal doses from your first implant three three times, and you see you're at 77, you better make some changes with that first implant so that if you did it the same exact way three times, you're going to only be up to 75. Now, I will also say that there is maybe 5 to 10% of our patients that our final rectal dose is 76, 77. <clears throat> and you have to remember these are patients with unique anatomy, and you're not going to achieve this in every single patient. If you find you're, you're getting over 75 in the majority of your patients, those, there's something wrong. The bladder 2cc dose, less than 80, uh, but acceptable is up to 90. And the sigmoid 2cc dose less than 70, but acceptable is up to 75. So I think those are the current Jack Astro guidelines that we're following. (coughs) Okay, great. Thank you so much. One other question that we have, when you're talking about eight gray times three, would that be once per week or twice per week? No, I Other fractionation. Yeah, I don't think eight grade times three is any different than other fractionation schemes. You can do it twice a week for one and a half weeks, or you can do it once a week if you're within your eight-week window. Okay, great. Thank you so much. But I wouldn't do three a week. I wouldn't do Monday, Wednesday, Friday with eight grade times three. Right. Okay. Uh, It looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, This was a great presentation. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, thanks everyone for your attention and great work out there. And again, we'll um, join again. You got the email. I don't remember the exact time at the moment, but I think it will be me presenting tomorrow. If not me, then one of my very good colleagues. 
uh, we'll be um, going through some live planning sessions. So we look forward to another uh, great session tomorrow and we're winding down, almost finished. Thank you. So thank you everyone. See you thank all tomorrow. You.